we're starting a new series today, a series about David. And I don't know if you know this, I hadn't really thought about it until I was researching, but David is one of the most, is the most written about person in the Bible other than Jesus. Next to him would be Abraham, who has 14 chapters written about him. But David has 66 chapters in the Bible chronicling his life from childhood till death. So obviously there's an emphasis on him. Even in the New Testament, he's talked about 59 times. The New Testament is after he was even alive. So it's kind of like sitting in history class and talking about the forefathers of our country hundreds of years later. He was a legacy. He was a legend. He was known for generation after generation after generation. So it caused me to ask the question, why was there so much emphasis on this guy's life? And as I read through it over and over again, I was like, man, there's so much we can learn from the life of David. So Pastor Mark and I, over the next few weeks, are going to be walking through some of those lessons that we can learn from David, even thousands of years later. And so um, I think he really wanted us to look at David, not just as an individual, but he's also many times a foreshadowing of what was to come through Jesus. So we can learn a lot about Jesus, even through the David story. So where does David's story begin? I want to take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 13 and the verses 13 through 14. Um, I want to read it to you. Samuel said to Saul. That's like an alliteration, like Samuel said to Saul, like tongue twister. But Samuel said to Saul, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commands. Samuel was a prophet. And they didn't have the Bible written up for them to go find out what God's word was at the time. And so Samuel was a messenger that God would send to the judges and the kings of this time. And he would be kind of the conduit of what God wanted them to do. His role was to make sure that judges and kings were following God's commands. We could use a Samuel, or could we not, in our government every generation. But here we are listening in on this conversation that he's having with this current king, Saul. And he's telling him, you're not doing what God told you to do. You're not following his commands. And because of that, you're going to be replaced. And he also says, God's already found someone to take your place. He's already appointed, was the word that he used, someone. And they don't even say his name, but eventually we will find out that this person he's referring to is David. And I love this because it paints such a beautiful picture of how God sees his children. He's talking about David, and he, even before his name has ever been mentioned, even before his story has ever been told, before he's done anything kingly at all, we see that God saw David. And not just did he visibly see David, he saw through the external things and he saw to his heart. Not only did he see his heart, but he called it good. He said it looks just like mine. Whoa. That's a huge statement from God's lips. His heart looks just like mine. And so it's amazing that he's, he's introducing this, this person that has a heart like God and we don't even know his name yet. He's appointed him before he's even introduced. Here in 1 Samuel 13, 4, we hear that David is being referred to as a man after God's own heart. How many of you have heard that phrase before? I'm going to guess it's in some kind of religious setting because that title has never been attached to anybody since David. I don't walk around and say, you know, my kids are great, but they don't, I don't say, you are just a little man after God's own heart. You know, that is just not a phrase that we throw around. So because that feels weighty, that feels heavy, that feels like a responsibility. And it was. And so we hear this mantle being placed on David and we haven't even met him yet. But I love how, you know, we talk about David because if you've read David's story before, you know that he's messy. He makes a lot of dumb choices later in his life. And we're going to talk through some of those throughout this series. And so theologically, we can say, how in the world can God call David, of all people, 
a man after God's own heart when he knows that he's about to make a whole bunch of stupid decisions as a grown man. And honestly, I can sit there as a type one and be like, that's wrong. That's not just, that's not right. Good people go to heaven, bad people, sorry, we love you. No, that's not how I think. And so when you read the scriptures, they're literally saying, there's a place for all of us in this story. Because David is being called a man after God's own heart, but we also know that he's messy. And if you think that church is for good people, you got this wrong. Church is for messy people. Church is for resurrected people. People who have recognized that they can't do this by themselves, so they surround themselves with fellow travelers and they seek God's word and his truth together to figure out how to be better, how to be a person that stands out in our culture. And so just like us, David is walking through his life and his story broken but also beloved. And so we can find ourselves in that. Israel is now in the search for a new king. But God isn't looking for a new king. He's looking for a heart, a genuine heart. So here we get to learn what is it that God looks for in leadership? What is his criteria for his kingdom? It's not age. It's not height. It's not gender. It's not race. It's not previous success or previous experience. It's not political affiliation or where you stand on certain social issues. God's measuring stick for leadership is the heart, a person's heart. Do you know what that means? That means God can use any one of us if we let him. Because if you're sitting here today, your heart is functioning. Even if you've had some parts added to it to make it work better, more efficiently, your heart is pumping, which means God can use you to lead well also. So all throughout the Bible, you'll find story after story of God using children, old people, women, liars, fishermen, short people. He's even used donkeys before to accomplish his purpose. So there's nothing off limits for God to use. If it has a heart that can be fully devoted to him, he can use it. And he often used the people that were on the not approved list. And I love that about God. He went away from the people that looked like leaders and presented as leaders. And he sought out the most unsuspecting people. So here we're going to see that only a healthy heart can bring about healthy leadership. I had the privilege of interviewing a friend of mine, Tyler Reagan. He's the president of Catalyst, and he wrote a book called Life-Giving Leader. And in our interview, he was, talking, he was talking about leadership here, and he said, I don't know anyone who walked away from their faith because of Jesus, but I know many who walked away because of the poor leadership of those who represent Jesus. And I hear the moans. Many of you are here at the bridge because you were hurt by poor leadership. Many of you are at home watching online because of the effect of poor leadership. Many of your family members won't even step doors in a church because somebody who represented Jesus hurt them. And so we're seeing that there's this theme that, yes, church is a safe place for messy people, but it's full of messy people. Really, the only leader that we can fully trust not to hurt us is the Lord himself. And so here we see that Saul, through his example, he's showing us that he had a leadership position, but he was a toxic leader. He was not leading from a healthy place. And so God said, you're going to be replaced with someone who has a good heart, a heart that's fully devoted to me. Saul has departed from God's command, and because of this, he's leading people away from God himself. But then there's David, who was before, before he's ever been put into any form of a position, we're shown the posture of his heart through scripture. He's a shepherd out in the field, and David himself wrote this prayer to God in Psalms 25, 5. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Point blank, guys, if we want to be life-giving leaders, it is impossible to be a life-giving leader if God is not leading you. 
You might feel really good about yourself. You might have a lot of power. You might be able to make things happen and go your way and get things done the way you want them to go. But the amount of impact and influence that you will have will obviously be so limited unless you're a leader who's putting their hope in God all day long. It's kind of like what John Wooden says, talent will get you to the top, but it takes your character to keep you there. If you're not fully devoted, your heart is not pursuing God all day long, then everything you do is going to have a shelf life. Saul had the talent. Saul looked the part. He was tall, he was strong, he was wealthy, and by all human standards, he looked like a leader. And he stood as a leader, and everyone would say, this is what we need. And so over time, his insecurities start to reveal themselves. His character, his heart started to flow out of him. And we start to see how he's taking matters into his own hands and he's departing from what God has called him to do and how he's called him to lead. And so we see this difference between Saul and David. They're both sinners. They're both messy. But the difference is David puts his hope in God all day long. Because God isn't looking for perfect people. He's looking for hearts that are fully devoted to him. That's his criteria. Are you in? Will you let me look for the gaps, look for the places of change, and show you a new way to do this thing? So at this point in the story, we know that Saul is going to be replaced. And I've already spoiled it and told you that it's going to be with David. But we haven't even met David yet, so I want to introduce you guys to him. So let's jump over to 1 Samuel 16. And Samuel the prophet is being sent by God to a town called Bethlehem. Have you ever heard of Bethlehem before? What, what happens in Bethlehem? Jesus. Well, give me more information. Jesus doesn't just happen. Where, what happens? Jesus is born, right? It's the beginning of the Christmas story. We celebrate it every December 25th or whatever day the Sunday falls on, right? And so here we go. We're, we're finding another connection where David's life is connecting to the foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do. So he's going to Bethlehem, and he's searching for the appointed king. God has already appointed him. We know this. We just don't know who it is. So he knocks on the door of a guy named Jesse. Now, his odds are really good with Jesse, because Jesse's got eight boys in his family. So Saul knew exactly where to start, or Samuel, sorry. I knew I was going to do that all day. Samuel knew exactly where to start. I'm going to the house with the most guys, right? And so he goes to that house, and he knocks on the door, and the oldest son comes out first. His name's Eliab. And he says, he looks at him, just looks at him, and thinks, that's the one. That's the guy. And, and it's so funny because God automatically hears his thoughts and challenges his way of thinking. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, God says, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the what? The heart. There it is again. If you didn't believe me before, God's telling us again that his measuring stick for leadership is a heart. And so he looks at the heart. And if that's God's way of evaluating people, As followers of his, shouldn't that be our criteria too? Whether you're hiring someone or looking at someone to possibly date, it shouldn't just be about skills and being good looking, but we should look at their character. We should look at how they treat people, look at the relationships, how people feel around them. Because you can teach somebody how to fix a car, but you can't teach somebody how to be compassionate for the driver. That only flows out of a good, healthy heart. So after God has put Samuel back in place and he's reminding him what to look for, a good heart, one by one, Jesse's sons start parading out. It's like this like, fashion show, you know, like they're all like, you know. There's no talent competition. There's no swimsuit part. It's just heart checks. And I wish I knew I wish I could, like, know how Samuel was evaluating their heart, you know? Like, they're not doing or saying anything, or at least there's no context for that. So it's like, does he have, like, an x-ray vision at this point? And he's like, nope, nope, 
I mean, I don't even know. But he's just, he's in his spirit, he knows. It's not that one. It's not that one. And one by one, they go parading in front of him, and they're not the chosen one that God has appointed. So this parade of sons takes a turn here at 1 Samuel 16, 10 through 11. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any one of these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? I mean, seven's a lot. So I'm thinking, that's good. But he's saying, is that all you have? And Jesse answered, they're still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. So Samuel says, send for him. Basically, Jesse had introduced Samuel to seven of his sons, but he has eight. What does this tell us about the dynamic in David's home? Was David overlooked? Was he ignored? Was he ostracized? Because not the dad or the brothers even mention that there's another one until Samuel asks. Maybe he grew up feeling like the runt of the litter amongst all these strapping boys. And maybe he's just being considered this dirty, stinky teenager out in the field singing away all the time and he's annoying. And I say he's singing all the time because if you read his story, he's a musician. He writes songs and poems and plays music. And so obviously David's family doesn't think that Samuel could possibly choose him to be the next king or else they would have called him into the house immediately. Oh, you're looking for a heart. Ah, let me tell you about David. You know, but nobody said anything. They all wanted the role. They all wanted the part. They didn't see those kingly qualities in their youngest brother and their youngest son. And maybe you grew up like that too. You felt overshadowed. I have an older sister and she was good at everything. So I literally chose sports she hadn't touched because I didn't want to be compared to her. Maybe you feel forgotten. No one ever seeing or calling out this potential you have. And if that's the case for you, I really hope that you see yourself in this part of his story. Because even though you may not feel visible in human eyes, you are valuable in God's eyes. And just a quick parenting tip here, moms and dads. Value every child in their uniqueness. Because God help us if we're just trying to raise mini-me's who carry the weight of our unmet dreams on their shoulders every day. We've got to remind ourselves that God has a purpose and a plan for them specifically, and we need to help them steer them towards that, not prescribe our own. So little did Jesse, his David's brothers, or David even know that every day that David is out in this field taking care of their dad's sheep, that David was being prepared to take a throne. And it just goes to show that we should never underestimate what God can do whatever season we're in. How every season that we go through can shape and position us for what's coming later. For the person that he's calling us to become. So 1 Samuel 16, 12 says, so Jesse sent for him. He's calling David in from the field. Because God had not instructed Samuel to anoint any of the other seven brothers that they had met from this family line, David gets sent for. Imagine the weight of this moment. This would be the last time David would walk from the shepherd's field to his house as the shepherd boy. Little did anybody know that in a few moments, he was now going to be ordained as the next king of Israel. So he's taking this walk towards his house, and it's projected that David is actually between the ages of 10 and 15 at this point. So you can't convince me that God waits for our students to grow up before he starts using them. He's been doing it for thousands of years. Now I love how when David enters the room, a little later in verse 12, God says, not Samuel, God says, that's the one. And I bet his brothers and his dad are thinking, David? Like, he, he takes care of sheep and he's a songwriter. I mean, maybe you could have him be the worship leader for the king, but, but he's not the king, right? Have you ever had somebody speak that kind of stuff over you? 
Maybe you've heard messages like that before. I know I have. People look at this, the position I'm in right now. Oh, she's just a stay-at-home mom with four kids. She could work in children's ministry, but she's not a Bible teacher. Maybe, you're, maybe your name is Wayne, and you're a retired grandpa, and people are saying, oh, you should become a greeter at Walmart. <laughs> but you really want to become a mentor to young adults. And nobody's calling that out in you and saying, yes. Hear me say, yes. The next generation wants your wisdom and your experience. Lean into them. Maybe your name is Sally. And you're a recovering alcoholic. And you hear all the time, oh, you're just getting your life together so you can help us decorate for the event. But you can't lead the meeting yet. But you know you have that potential inside of you. So imagine David who has a heart like God's, working in the shepherd's field, surrounded by people who don't see his potential, and he's walking into this house where Samuel is literally going to say, you are a king. We hear messages like that all the time. We can find people when what people can do based on whatever current chapter they're in or role they have. So I need you to see right here that God knows how to move heart players like David into kings. And he wants to do the same thing with us. So if they didn't call you, they can't disqualify you. 1 Samuel 16, 13. So as David stood there among his brothers, imagine the tension of the room. Samuel takes out this flask of olive oil that he brought with him and anoints David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. David was going to be the future king of Israel. God had first appointed him and declared him so based on his heart. And here Samuel was anointing him for the position. But it was going to be a while before he took the throne. So we're going to talk about that journey for David over the next couple of weeks. So I want to just kind of point out, as we look at this story unfolding for David, what are some takeaways that we can learn from this specific chapter in David's life? First of all, we can learn from David that David was faithful in the field. David wasn't anxiously awaiting a ticket out of Bethlehem. He was content serving in the field. He was being faithful right where he was at. And it begs me to ask, are you being faithful in the field you're in right now? Because if you're being faithful in the field where God has called you right now, he will move you forward into your future at the right time. Stop telling God you're ready for the next thing. Don't you think that the God who knows you better than you know yourself knows when you're ready for the next thing he has for you? You might think it's just a promotion and you feel like you're ready for that. And God might be saying, I want to give you the whole company and you're not ready for that. Maybe you just think it's the next rung on the ladder and he's saying, I want you to own the ladder. My plans for you are bigger, they're greater, and you're going to need more in your character to sustain it. So be patient Be faithful in the field where you're at right now. If you haven't heard a new assignment yet, be faithful with your current one. Another thing that we can learn from David is that David was faithful in the familiar. No matter what the weather was, what mood he was in, how the sheep were acting, he showed up and went to work in the fields and did his job. Some days it was quiet and peaceful and he could write poems and songs and other days wild animals would come and he would have to fight back and protect the sheep. But no matter what happened, he was there without complaint, putting his hope in God all day long. So when you feel like you're on this hamster wheel and you're just paper pushing or you're doing the same thing over and over again, find the joy that is there recognizing that it's preparing you for what's next. Be faithful with what's familiar. Number three, David was faithful when forgotten, 
We heard about how when he was out in the field, his dad and his siblings didn't even mention him. He was overlooked. But there was a sense of security for David where he wasn't striving, trying to earn their attention. He wasn't trying to perform like, I'm going to be the best shepherd there has ever been so they'll notice me. He wasn't fighting to find his place. He was secure. And I can't help but tie that back to what his prayer was, that he puts his hope in God all day long. He knew that the person who knew him best didn't just know him, saw his heart, but he knows every single hair that's on his head, and that was enough for him. He stood confident in that. He was secure. Because whenever there's an appointing or an anointing that's going to happen in your life, there's always going to be a season of process and preparation that comes before it. And so God was watching David. He was watching how he cared for the sheep. He was watching how he praised the Lord no matter what his days were filled with and what the situation was around him. He watched how he handled the rejection of his family. All of those were little pieces of the puzzle that put together how God saw him as a king. And he's watching us too. Not in the, I'm waiting for you to screw up again so I can smite you kind of way. But actually in Second Chronicles 16.9 it says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. There's that word again, hearts. God is searching and watching, not because he wants to do harm or he wants to evaluate you, but because if your heart is fully devoted to him, he wants to strengthen you. And I need that strength on a daily basis. And I'm gonna assume you guys do too. He's watching how we navigate those hard conversations with our children and how we manage our teams and how we handle the finances we've been placed in charge of. Every time we clock in, God is watching to see, are they going to work the amount of hours that they're supposed to work? Are they going to walk in integrity? Are they going to honor and respect the authority that's been placed above them? Are they going to stay out of the gossip and backbiting of their coworkers? Can I trust them with more because they're being faithful in the field they're in right now? Even when it feels familiar, even if they feel forgotten and overlooked. Fourth thing we can learn from David is that David was faithful in the future. How can somebody be faithful in the future? Well, think about this. Samuel has said to David in front of his brothers that you are going to be the future king of Israel. And this oil is falling over his head. And I can't imagine the the weight of that title as he hears, you are a man after God's own heart. You are the next king of Israel. And his brothers and his dad are standing by and, and just feeling the weight of that ordination. He could have said, after Samuel leaves, I quit. I'm not going back to that field. I don't have to get my hands dirty anymore. Send one of my brothers to do it. I'm going to pop some popcorn and watch some Netflix and wait till my throne arrives. (laughs) He totally could have been cocky and had a big head about it and prideful and being like, I'm man after God's own heart. Now you do the dishes. I mean, he could have totally taken this to an extreme. And I love that, that he shows us that he didn't. That he still went right back to serving his family. He submitted to the current King Saul's laws and authority, that he returned to what he was doing before, and he had this renewed commitment to do well what God put in front of him, because now he was the future king. He was patient and humble. Even though he knew there was a throne in his future, he was faithful where he was at. And God has called you and I to lead and lead well right now. He's surveying the room and looking for faithful shepherds in their field. He wants to make us into women and men after his own heart. But how does that even happen? David wrote in Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. David is saying, hold me accountable, God. Keep me in check. Make sure that what I do is flowing out of who I am as a child of yours, not who people think I am, not who I'm trying to be, but as your son, let everything I do flow out of that space. The self that you have called, that you have appointed, that you have now anointed, keep me under your, under your supervision. And he's asking God, look at my heart. Find the ways that I can change in order to improve the story that I'm living. For God is the true reformer. So before we leave today, I want to actually take some time and all of us ask God to check our hearts too. So put your pens down, put your Bibles away, because I know you guys are taking mad notes right now. Set those, set those notebooks aside. Take a deep breath with me. How's your heart right now? I'll check in with your heart right now. How are you handling rejection? How are you stewarding the season that you're in? How are you dealing with that difficult boss? How are you speaking to your children and your spouse? Are you living as a person of integrity? Are you being respectful to those that you disagree with? Are you allowing God to meet you in the messiness of who you are right now and make you whole instead of constantly searching for the next fix or the next fling to numb your pain? So with heads bowed and eyes closed all across this room, maybe there's some of you who would say, my heart hurts. I am not okay, Bethany. And I need you to know that the church is a place where you can say that. It is okay to not be okay. I need God to work in my heart right now. I want God to create in me a heart that is fully devoted to him. So if that's you, let me pray for you. God, there are people in this room that are feeling invisible, discouraged, exhausted, hopeless and alone. And Lord, we reach out and ask you to search our hearts, to know our thoughts and show us a new way. We want to be life-giving leaders like you are. We want to love without limits and remain peace-filled no matter what storms we may face. We want to reflect your heart through our own. And so we ask you today to show us how, God. Amen. As I said earlier, David is a foreshadowing of what was to come through Jesus. And if you don't know yet this Jesus that I'm talking about who died on the cross so that you could experience a free life, then I want to talk to you specifically for a moment. Because God loves you. And he's offering you a heart transplant. And in Ezekiel 36, 26, it tells us that God said, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And that's my story. When I placed my life in God's hand, he gave me a new heart. What you need to know about that heart is that it's squishy. It loves hard, but it still hurts. But God says, I'm not going to promise you that it's going to be easy. I'm just going to promise you you won't be alone anymore. So when you hear people saying, ask Jesus into your heart, that's what they're saying. Let God, invite God to show you how to do this life thing well from the inside out. And so I want to say a prayer. 
And actually, I want all of you to repeat the words after me. So that even if this isn't your first time saying this, for those that are around us, that they're, they're finding the courage and the boldness to step into the story that God has for them, that they will feel our sense of love and support surrounding them as well. So let's pray. God, you love me. I can't deny it any longer. What you have sent your son Jesus to do just proves it. Today I surrender. I tried it my way. And it isn't working. I need you. Meet me here. Replace my stubborn heart with a heart like yours. From this day forward, I am all in. Amen. Can we give it up for the people who said that for the first time today? Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey.